Listen up. Welcome to the PowerShell Podcast, the podcast for PowerShell and the PowerShell community. And now, here's your host, Andrew Plaw. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the PowerShell Podcast. Very exciting podcast in store for us today. But first, we've got some community news items. Usually, we give a good rundown of different blogs and projects that are available in the community. But this week, I want to give a shout out to psweekly.daus.dev. It is a fantastic curated list of projects every week by Matthew Daus, who we've interviewed in the past. Check that out every week. It's a great supplementary resource to see what's going on with the community. And guess what? The podcast is mentioned in it. Check that out. Check out this book by a guy named Don Jones called Shell of an Idea. Now, I'm going to talk to Jeffrey today, but Shell of an Idea goes into a lot more depth about the history of PowerShell and all the people and decisions and wild stories to get PowerShell to where it is today. If you haven't yet, join us on the PDQ Discord, discord.gg slash PDQ. Check me out on the PowerShell scripting channel, episode feedback. We share tools. We have a nice chat there. But let's get to the meat and potatoes of the episode. On this episode, we're going to have a fantastic inventor of PowerShell, community person, friendly guy, friend of the show, Jeffrey Snover. Welcome to the podcast. Howdy, how are you doing? It's fantastic to have you here, man. We've been doing this podcast for a while. It's excited to get the, the shell father himself here. And I want to say thank you on behalf of the community for inventing PowerShell and giving us this tool that we celebrate every week here on the podcast. And a lot of us have had great impact to our lives uh, resulting from something like PowerShell. It's kind of a, a wild thing, but I know I've personally been heavily impacted. Um, and it, it's super cool because when you give people a way to automate and to solve problems and to add skills to their resume that results in promotions and more money, that has such a trickling effect far beyond tech. And so thank you for that. And welcome to the pod. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> it, it is kind of cool though, right? It's something like you know, we talk about it all the time. We love the the coolness of the tech and how efficient it is, but also that real world impact of really changing lives. It, it doesn't take a lot to really have a big impact on someone's life. And it's just cool that we get to experience the best of both worlds with PowerShell. Yeah, I tell you, that is the best thing in the world, you know, to, to go to a conference or something and, and then to just have uh, people just tell the, their story, how the tool was able to help them in their career, how it made them the hero of their company, and how they were then recognized and rewarded for it. And the number of people who told me that, they, you know, they got promotions, they doubled their salary. Some people, well, actually quite a few people tripled their salary. Now, if you think about it, tripling your salary, that is a life-changing thing. And so, you know, look, to be clear, PowerShell was always, always, always about the users. And so then when you see it having that effect on the users, well, I just got to say, you know, touchdown, success. And I just love it. It's so fun, especially with the community is open and welcoming as the PowerShell community. It's just, you get a lot of personal growth there too, as people grow as professionals and learn to communicate and share ideas. It's, it's a really cool avenue for a whole bunch of stuff, automation, growth, money, you like it. Yeah, you know, actually that was one of the kind of key insights. And I'm trying to remember if this happened at the beginning or somewhere in the middle. But at some point, basically we kind of realized that GUIs were antisocial. Right? So what does that mean? Well, think about it. You're gonna solve a problem. You go click, 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 click. So he says, wow, that was useful. Um, how do I do that? And you're like, uh, or, or what they do is they say, okay, well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll tell you. And they uh, start a Word document and then they snip and they paste and snip and paste. And then all of a sudden you got a 40 page Word document that says, here's how you do, do things. It's like, well, nobody does that, right? Um, well, actually we used to, you remember when we used to have the install guide where was all this like click, click, click. And it's like a hundred plus word, uh, you know, page word file. Whereas a command line interface, it's like click, 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 click. Oh, what did you do? Oh, well here, let's, let me show you my history. Let me cut and page my history and I'll email it to you. And it enabled a community. Um, so yeah, I mean, we figured that one out. It's like, oh, this is going to be awesome. So pre PowerShell, when you were at Microsoft, what was your role that allowed you to sort of explore creating a tool 
like power <laughs> well i wasn't allowed to explore that was not how it worked um basically i was uh the i was hired as the chief architect over all the managing products and technologies right <clears throat> and so then let's see so through a weird set of things basically what had happened was okay we're gonna hear the real story okay this no i no longer i guess i get to tell the real story so what had happened was um i you was going to take that role and be part of Windows Server. And like 20 minutes after I faxed in my letter of acceptance, I got this fat, this call from my, who was going to be my boss. I thought he was there to congratulate me. And he says, oh, yeah. actually, there's been a reorg. <laughs> You're not going to come work for me. You're going to work in this other team, and it's going to focus in on management. I was like, okay, well, that's a downside. But then maybe a plus side. Anyway, so then we went to work for them. I went to work for them, and uh, we did that, right? Uh, managed. You know, architect for all the products and and, and technologies, uh, including WMI. That's where I did WMIC. Anyway, so that went for a while, and then at some point, uh, that group was not supporting the Windows Server. Like, the Windows Server was bending over backwards, like trying to support, trying to support, trying to support, but it wasn't getting what it needed. So then one day, guess what? You don't get to mess with the big dog. So one day, Windows woke up and decided it was going to take half that organization and do its own management thing. At that point, my boss just sort of collapsed, you know, went into the into her office, closed the door, and the whole organization kind of shut down. There was never an all hands saying, hey, here's what happened, or an email saying, here's what happened. It just kind of shut down. So there I am, staff. I'm a, I report to her, I'm staff, I'm trying to help things, and there's nothing to do. Like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Anyway, so Bill Gates had been beating us up pretty regularly about this dot .NET, dot .NET, dot .NET. And I just kept saying, you know, Bill, you know, our hair is on fire, and dot .NET does not look like a bucket of water. I mean, I get it. I love it. Happy days. But that's not what we need. In the same way, um, uh, Jim Alchin, who had run Windows, et cetera, he came to, you know, when I came to the company, he said, okay, Jeffrey, tell me about this WMI. You know, is it good? Should we be supporting it? I said, Jim, it's fine, but here's the deal. I could get the job done with SNMP. What I need is coverage. That's the only thing I need. Now, WMI is far better than SNMP, but if I don't have the coverage, I'm doomed. And so there's always this struggle, right? How do you get coverage? And because Microsoft was in a place where you couldn't just say, hey, everybody write WMI providers or everybody do this. Every little team, every little guy, we used to call them pumps, product unit managers. They had, anybody that had 40 to 100 people working for them, they were their own CEO, their own CEO, their own CTO. Uh, they had their own strategy. They were doing their own damn thing. And so when you say, hey, I need everybody to write a WMI provider, their answer was, you know, I'm busy. Get out of here. Yeah. Um, so, so that was the context. So Bill had been beating us up on oh, .NET, .NET, .NET. And so I thought, well, you know, I want to investigate. What, uh, by the way, so my point was to Bill, Bill, .NET, is, is it, like if that gives me the coverage, happy days. But what I need is coverage, not a better technology. I already got something better than SNMP. Anyway, so Bill had been beating us up. I thought, well, you know, maybe Bill will give me the coverage I need. And so I drilled into it. And, um, and I, what I did was I decided I'd use .NET to rewrite WMIC because I didn't understood some really interesting uh, architectural patterns in WMIC. I thought, okay, well, I'll just do this. And there I learned, of course, what the way the world is, right? The world always is, is, and always will be messy, right? So .NET, oh, now there's this unified object model. No, right? Okay, yeah, um, like the graphics guy have a point and a rectangle, and that's what you think it was. But WMI, guess what? WMI had two objects, or well, it had one object, WMI object. <laughs> and then they had a bunch of, of, you know, it had a property called type and then properties and system properties. It's like, and then ADS, ADS, you know, Active Directory did the same thing and uh, SQL did the same thing. So basically everybody was implementing their own type system using WM, doing.net. Anyway, so um, as I say, the net here was organizational change. My organization collapsed. I had nothing to do. So I said, oh, I'll go investigate this. I tried to convince some people. I, I, I figured it out. 
tried to convince some people, hey, here's the way to go do the new shell. They didn't get it. Explained it, explained it, explained it. They didn't get it. But you know what? I'll just demo it. And so I kind of locked myself in the office for about a month, did a hundred or sorry, 10,000 line prototype. At that point, I had it all, like all the core uh, concepts and was able to show it to people and people's heads exploded. And I had somebody, a senior guy say, hey, Jeffrey, uh, uh, be careful what you're doing. This is the sort of thing that gets people fired because <laughs> this, this could be viewed as a misappropriation of, of corporate resources if nobody told you to go do that work. I said, well, what else? Nobody told me, I don't have anything else to do, so I'm gonna do this. Uh, so that's how it came about. Interesting. So. Sounds like uh, you went with the approach of ask for forgiveness, not permission. Ask for forgiveness. Yes, that's right. Interesting. So I think high, that high stakes game. I mean, that work could have gone the other way. He said, you know, a lot of people have been fired doing that, doing the very thing that you've done. So watch it. But you saw you saw the problem, and you thought it was a big enough problem that it was worth that sort of risk. Yeah, you know, I'd seen, well, first I didn't know what, the, what else was I going to do. It was, you know, my organization had collapsed. We weren't doing anything. The people I've been working for were now in some other organization. It was just sort of a mess. And yeah, I, I had seen this architectural pattern in WMIC. So let's talk about that. So I came to Microsoft and I said, hey, we need automation. We need command line interfaces. And people didn't get it. People didn't get it. People didn't get it. Finally, my boss gets it. I remember the meeting. She gets it. And she says, okay, which 10? I said, I'm sorry, what do you mean? She said, well, we can't do them all. So which 10 command line should we do? It's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. And I mentioned to you, every organization was their own CTO, right? So I couldn't go to those people and say, what? Did that? Hey, write command line interfaces, and guess what their answer was? Yep. <laughs> so, so I thought, okay, well, hey, give me some funding, and we'll work with contractors, and the contractors will write these things. Okay, and so basically, we got about four million dollars, and uh, farm this out, and we got about seventy-two commandlets. But then, you know, I mentioned we had WMI. We had a value proposition problem with WMI, which is to say. When somebody wrote a WMI provider, what value did they get? And the answer was, what? Well, you know, at some point you write a provider and at some point somebody's going to buy like Tivoli and uh, then take advantage of it. Boom, enterprise management. Except I had just come from, that was the story, right? Except I had come from Tivoli where I did all that work. I was like, no, no, no. We just did a checkbox. You know, there's no real value there uh, because why would I invest in value until you have the the uh, uh, providers? So it's this chicken and egg thing. So there was no value there. So I thought, well, you know what? But if at least you write a WMI provider, you get a command line for free. That's something. So I said, hey, I got I need a little bit more money, and then we're going to write this WMI provider. Now the PMs at the time said, like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll just write a bunch of sh you know scripts to call WMI. It's like no, 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 no. It requires a little more background here. So there were so many times where development teams would write software only to have it go in the dustbin because the test team said, we, we don't have the bandwidth to test it. Oh, well, you can't test it. You can't ship it. Throw it away. And so I said, hey, if you just go write a bunch of scripts on top of your WMI, they're all going to get binned because the test organization's full. I said, but... Instead, if they can say, hey, I only have one command I want you to test, and then that command is driven off metadata, well, you don't test every metadata, right? You don't test every HTML page, right? You, you test the browser. So that was the idea. Like, ah, and um, they didn't want to do that. And I just ran, you know, every time, here's a, here's a lesson. As a senior person, you got to know when to be a jerk. <laughs> if you're always a jerk, you're not going to get anywhere. If you're never a jerk, you're probably not being the leader you need to be. So this is one of those times I saw, hey, this is a key architectural thing. We ha it has to be metadata driven. That's it. Full stop. We're going to do it that way. And we did it that way. And um, we wrote this engine, uh, had a common command line parser, called WMI, got the objects, did some stuff, output the results, and then had this metadata contract. And then over Christmas weekend, I used that metadata thing and I produced like 70 commands of my own, like in a week. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is good. This is, this is good. 
But then I realized, hey, wait a second, I can get, I got a time before, a little bit more time before we ship and uh, I can get some more money. I, and so I went and got some more money. And then what I did was I improved the engine itself. And what happened was when I improved the engine itself, all of the 70 commands got better, each one of them. So I added filtering, all of them got filtering. I added formatting, all of them got formatting. I added output to XML, all of them got out to XML. And I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And so that was the heart of like the, you know, the discovery and the invention of sort of the core ideas. Like, hey, if you have a common parser uh, and you generate objects, and you have a common engine, then you can invest things and then everybody gets better. So remoting, oh, well, hey, your command should do remoting. No, I'll do the remoting. Hey, you should uh, output to JSON. No, I'll output to JSON. And everybody gets the benefit. And so that's actually the, if you think about it and you step back and you say, hey, what's so cool about PowerShell? There's lots of it. But in my mind, the cool thing is this architectural coupling that allows me to invest in the engine and then everybody uniformly gets better, right? The idea of a ubiquitous parameter. Hey, I'm gonna output something um, and then I might wanna capture, you know, pipeline it, uh, but that at each stage of the pipeline, I might wanna capture the, vari the output as a variable. Like, oh, we'll try and do that in bash, right? And the answer is, you have to decompose it into a set of lines and explode your memory, right? And here it's like, oh, well, I'll just add a common parameter, output variable, and I'll capture it. Oh, anyway, so that that to me, that's the the magic of PowerShell. Yeah, I think it really. Uh, one thing I was listening to an earlier interview. Maybe we'll check out a clip from it later. But you talked about economic impact and the importance yes. of that. And I think that what you're describing sort of is that, right? You you create this framework that other people can kind of plug into and all benefit from. And it has this massive, it goes across all different products and services and teams and organizations. You got it. And by the way, so now, right? So here's the thing. So with that engine, right? So now I still need the commands themselves, right? And those, the teams, you know, uh, they really are the ones that need to do it. And so what I did was I said, hey, I'm gonna create a value proposition where they write the code that they and only they could write, okay? And then I'll do the rest of it, right? And so again, they come back and they're like, yeah, I'm busy. And it's like, hey, 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 just do this. And they'd peel off somebody and do this. And then they'd see like, oh my heavens, like I wrote these, you know, couple hundred lines of code and look at all the stuff that I get. It's like, this is a good deal. And like, and then they show it to the customers and customers are like, that's a good deal. I like that. And so then it bought in, it made economic sense for them. Again, their hair is on fire, right? They, they weren't, they weren't. Not all of them were <laughs> just arbitrary jerks. Their hair was on fire. They had 10 things to do and only capacity to do one of them. So they had to say no to nine other things. And there I was knocking on the door. But if I could craft a good economic story, um, then they could look at this and say, hey, the payback on this is good. I'm going to do it. And that's that's kind of how it worked. That's the way to go about it. I guess whenever you're in a big business trying to do things, you have to... You can't just say, hey, this is a good thing we need to do. You sort of need to make that case to them. Well, right. And in particular, like, so I learned this at, um, that's what the right thing. Okay, so you remember Azure Stack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Azure Stack. One of the challenges we had with Azure Stack was to get the Azure services to keep their stuff up to date running on Azure Stack. And I remember having a conversation with one of the execs who basically told me, yeah, I'm going to screw you. I was like, Okay, tell me more about that. He says, well, listen, you know, uh, I got my public service and I, I, I'm not, I got a problem with it. And, uh, and then I got to keep your stuff up to date. He says, if I don't keep your stuff up to date, I'm going to get yelled at. He says, but if I don't make progress on the public service, I'm going to get fired. So guess what? I'm going to screw you. <laughs> I'll get yelled at at it, but at least I'll be here and further on down the road, maybe I can do something about that. And so that's the point. Whenever you have like this broad initiative, whatever you're thinking, right? Chances you're going to people and like, this is not like gonna, like if they don't do it, like if you get executive buy-in, like, oh, you know, Bill Gates says you have to do this. Like they're gonna look at this and say, well, uh, okay, Bill Gates is gonna yell at me, but he's not gonna fire me if I do this. And, but he, if, I, if my day job, if I don't do that, he will fire me. 
And so you have to think about that and be sensitive to that. And just because you got buy-in from the top doesn't mean anything. You're like, like just concretely, Bill Gates was always a supporter. Bill Gates got it from the very, very, very beginning. From the first time I showed it to him, he's like, of course. Uh, and that helped exactly zero. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing whatsoever. Did it at least make you feel a little bit more confident? Like maybe there's a chance? Well, no, I knew in my bones. I mean, because you could see it. You use it. You know, that was the thing that made me say, no, I know. I know. So, I mean, it felt good that Bill understood it. Like, okay. But no, I. you could just see it. I mean, whenever there was any kind of like, oh, uh, all these people are telling me, you know, Jeffrey, what part of F and Windows do you not understand? All that. Uh, there were some moments of like, huh, maybe I'm wrong. And then you just sit down with it and you use it. And you're like, no, no, they're wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. This is gold. So you mentioned how there's this sort of core engine and things can be built on top of it and it extends other things. And that was a great way to sort of get PowerShell off the ground and started at Microsoft. But I think that same principle applies to people out there listening, trying to implement PowerShell in their organizations. You have this core competency of understanding how PowerShell works a little bit, and then you're able to apply it to all these different technologies. And it reminds me of a tweet that you put out a while ago. It was something along the lines of invest in PowerShell and it'll be the best decision you've ever made. And I think that that rings true for so many people. Yeah, that was our goal, right? So the other context here is that Microsoft had has this history of like, oh, this is the brand new thing. And then oh, everybody jumps on that bandwagon. And then they're like, okay, squirrel. <laughs> and they go off and do something else and then abandon this thing. It's abandonware, right? And by the way, that, I mean, it really was a thing. I remember, uh, uh, by the way, can you swear on this podcast? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so we had just shipped a version of Windows and uh, execs get us in the room and they say, okay, what, what are we gonna do for the next version? And I get up on the whiteboard and I say, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna finish this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. And, um, and it's all this like, we started this, we gotta finish this, we got here, we need to get there, et cetera. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. We, you know, we gotta have something that pops, something that pops, something that's gonna be, you know, can make it into the keynote. And I said, pops? How about now it freaking works? How about that for pop? I'm like, no, 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 we're gonna eat something that's gonna pop. It's like, oh, good Lord. Anyway, so, you know, they were chasing the headline at a conference as opposed to understanding the customer, understanding what the customer needed to succeed, right? Because honestly, we just know that, that those first versions aren't what it takes to succeed. You need to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. You know. To, Again, back to the kind of culture of that. So even before PowerShell version one shipped, you know, they come to me and they say, hey, Jeffrey, what's your next big thing? I said, well, I got to ship this. And they go, well, but your career is going to get hurt if you don't have an, uh, something beyond this. I was like, go away. <laughs> it's like, okay, now I'm working on shipped it. And they're like, hey, Jeffrey, okay, shipped version one. Now what are you going to do? And so I'm going to ship version two. I'm like, well, you can't, you got to do something new. You know, you're a senior guy. You got to do something new or you're going to get hurt. I was like, go away. I'm going to ship version two. And I did it with version three. I think it after I shipped version three or four is when I said, okay, well, I'll take on additional responsibilities, but I'm going to stay with this. Now, the point there being that like, hey, you know I'm going to ask people, their hair's on fire, and I'm going to ask them to learn a new thing. And I treat that seriously. And, and that's why we called it the sacred vow. Now, when was the last time a product team <laughs> to, went to their customer base and said, I'm making you a sacred vow? In fact, I don't know anybody that's ever done that. And we did. And we said, we, you know, it's my sacred vow. You learn this, and I'm going to do everything in our capability to make sure it's the most beneficial thing you ever did, right? So I'm not going to run away after version one. I'm not going to run away after version two. You know, we're going to keep improving this thing and we're going to grow it and we're going to grow the community and we're going to make it like, you know, make you successful if you learn this. Um, so I, I actually feel pretty good about that one. One, like getting our, our heads and our hearts in the right place. Like this is about the user and we're asking them to make a commitment. And we're going to make a commitment to them. By the way, just to be clear, I had no coverage for that whatsoever. Like zero. No executive said, oh, Jeffrey, go out and make a sacred vow. I just like, in a, in a talk, I just said it. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> and, then, and then the team adopted it. And we all said, yes, this is our sacred vow. 
So that one worked out pretty well. Yeah, they, they took it and ran with that one. That was a, a great leadership decision. So we're kind of going back to the early days. I kind of, I want to go on a little bit of a trip down memory lane with you, if you'll humor me for okay. a minute and 37 seconds. I'll play a clip okay. uh, where you're talking about how the pipeline works in Unix and thinking about Monad back in the day. And then we'll talk about some of the decisions that make PowerShell unique. Ah, go. great. The other answer is the reason why you pipe A to B to C, why A doesn't do what you want it to do, is because it tightly binds three separate steps into one step. Okay, A gets a set of objects, it processes those objects, and then it outputs the result, typically as text. And so then when you pipe it to B and to C, what you're really doing is you're taking that text and you're trying to reverse your engineer your way back to the original objects because you didn't get the right ones, you didn't process them the way you wanted to, or you didn't output them the way you wanted to. So the observation was, geez, you know, you spend all your time doing all this prayer-based parsing, right? Cut off three lines, go over 27 count. You know, sometimes when I do this switch, it's four lines. Well, let's just pray it's three. Let's go over 27 columns. I'm going to pray that there's not a tab there. I'm going to grab this thing, and, and what the hell is it? You know, well, I'm going to pray that it's a 32-bit unsigned integer, because that's how I'm going to use it, right? And, and it works pretty well, but you spend all your time thinking about how you're going to get stuff done instead of getting stuff done. Right. And so uh, I was doing this deep rethink as I was looking at the .NET APIs and .NET reflection. And I said, oh my heavens, we can do better here. We can do great. In fact, instead of having pipelines of text, what we can do is to have pipelines of objects. And then when you want to access some method, some property on the object, just ask for the property right. instead of having to do all the parsing. Right. So you see what we've done is a, we've produced a model where all that parsing goes away and people are allowed to think about the, the problem that they want and just type it and they get it. The power is extraordinary. And the power is extraordinary. I tell you what, it's one of the most enjoyable things I talk about on the podcast. Once you get fluent with PowerShell, when you're able to just write, when you're able to just connect commands and, and, and you get know, in that flow. Yes. yes. So good. But, so good. That's when I appreciate PowerShell the most, I think, is whenever I'm just embracing the beauty of the language, having a good time with the language I'm fluent with, solving problems yeah. interactively. Oh, man. Well, you know, um, uh, um, Bruce Payette had made the observation, and it's great. He said, you know, about, um, I forget what his number was. He says, if you take a look at programs, he says, some huge percentage of the program is impedance match uh, resolution, right? I call an API, and I got a string, and now I got to call this other API that needs a day time. And so then I got to do all this, like, blah, 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 and then get this, and then do that. And, oh, and then this, I got one of this shape, and it needs it in that shape, so I recast it and uh you pointed out that you know that's one of the key powers of powershell is that we make that impedance mismatch go away yeah you know? and also the pipeline so i think that a lot of the things in powershell were sort of borrowed from other languages and repurposed or sort of took the best out of a few different places yep. what was the thinking with pipelines no the pipeline well let's see so um you know, I was a big fan of, I was a Unix guy originally, yeah, and then I went to VMS DCL, and I hated it. Like, ah, oh, this thing, I, oh, I hate it, and, uh, and I kept struggling, and at some point, I just needed to say, okay, just, just, I hated it because it wasn't Unix. I said, well, just learn it for what it was, and so I stopped hating it because it wasn't Unix, and then I learned it, and I'm like, wow, this thing is fantastic. But it didn't have pipelines. <laughs> uh, and so, by the way, the thing that was great on it, it's regular. It, it had the idea of like no a single common parser for everything, right? Common um, uh, parameters on commandlets, things like that. But there was no pipeline. But no, the pipeline was mine. That was, it came out of the, uh, you know, the discovery I had made in uh, WMIC about, hey, once I've got a common object, uh, then I can uh, manipulate it through a pipeline. In fact, if you go back and look at the original WMIC, and I don't know if it's even documented, but it's there, you can stream a series of XSLT transforms. In fact, I say, uh, I tried to redo WMIC and .NET. When in fact, what I was going to do is a, an entire XML-based um, uh, um, uh, shell and have XSLT transforms. And I don't know, if, have you ever used awk? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you know awk, you, you look at it and you're like, what the heck? And uh, then you use it a few times. And after you use it a 
you know, dozen or two dozen times, like, oh, okay, I get it. And then you can write awk. And so uh, have you ever used XSLT? Ever. Okay, don't. <laughs> so you look at XSLT and clearly it's incredibly powerful. It's basically this tree walker manipulator, right? Because XML is a tree. So you walk the tree and you manipulate things. And so I thought, okay, well, geez, this is really complicated. This must be like awk, right? You got to do it a dozen or two dozen times. And after hundreds of times, it's like, no, this thing just sucks. <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> so I realized it's not going to be XSLT. It's going to be objects, pipelines of objects. Um, and so again, by the way, and then that problem I mentioned, okay, pipelines of .NET objects, but then the types are all different. So we had to write this adaptive type system. And that was one of the other kind of key innovations. Exciting. And pretty nice that these decisions were made early on. You know, I think it would be, it's a good thing that you planned things out appropriately and did your research. And it sounds like your head was in that space pretty majorly. Like you were really yeah. observing and trying to figure out the best patterns. Well, this is the difference between code and architecture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> architecture, you think it out. What are the ramifications of this? By the way, I mean, a lot of this uh, um, is kind of simple stuff, right? So one question was, okay, how many commandlets are they going to be? Well, what does that mean? Okay, how many commandlets are they going to be? How many are... Is Windows going to serve, sell, ship? How many is Microsoft going to ship? How many is the industry going to ship? And then for any particular customer, how many are they going to use? And then when you pulled on that thread, it's like, oh, why do I need to answer that? It's like, well, it defines the naming issue, right? So like get a user. Hey, is it get user or is it get 80 user, get SQL user, et cetera? And so this is where we said, oh, okay. So now all of a sudden, if it's just user, I got a problem. So then we had this idea of the facility code, right? Two to four letters in front of a noun to disambiguate it, right? So why not the whole thing? Why not uh, get Windows server user? Because that's too big. Right. So, um, and by the way, we do have some where we own the noun, but then there's the, I don't know, we did not do this uh, entirely, but we came upon the right answer, which was when we own the noun, it's because we have a framework underneath it and we will extend the framework with heterogeneous things, uh, but we'll provide a common experience up to, up to the users. But if we're not doing that, then we shouldn't. No, nobody gets to own the noun. You have to prefix your, your noun with a facility code. It all, again, had to do with, uh, okay, what is the naming collisions going to look like? How many are they going to be? You know, uh, with how many are they going to be? Okay, that tells you, geez, do I need to uh, look up the names uh, dynamically or do I have a catalog? So what was the idea behind the verbosity of PowerShell? You mentioned it's a verb noun, but I think compared to something like awk, we have a lot more yes. characters. So that was definitely a decision, right? Uh, yep. What led to that? Uh, the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, uh, I worked at a startup company and uh, we shipped software well before it was ready. <laughs> okay. And so, this company, medical systems company, took our software, Mumps, Mumps compiler, and uh, Put, to put their software on top of it and shipped it to the a hospital, the Elvis Presley Memorial Center. I was horrified. And then get the call. Hey, it's not working. Yeah, you think? <laughs> and like, you got to come down here and, and get it working. So, like, okay, great. Uh, how long? Uh, a day or two. Like, okay, great. So I, I pack enough stuff for a day or two. I was there like nine or 10 days. I mean, it was insane. I was sleeping on the data center floor. I didn't shower for over a week. I ate out of a vending machine. I had people waking, and hospital administrators waking me up on the data center floor. Jerry, Jerry, you got to get that thing working. I got I got patients that, you know, uh, uh, IV bags that they, they can't get into the hospital because this thing's not working. I was like, oh my God. Anyway, Anyway, so there it is, three in the morning, just woken up by this hospital administrator because they can't get patients through something. And, and I'm, I'm there and I'm fixing database tables and I'm stitching them together. And I remember looking, I'm writing the script that's going to, I see what the problem is. I'm going to stitch all these records together. And I'm looking at this and I realize, I look at this record and it's half of a record and it's gunshot wound abdomen. And I'm like, 
oh my God, there's some guy out there with a freaking bullet in his belly and I got to find the other part of his record or he's not going to get medical care. And it's three o'clock in the morning and I haven't slept well and I've been eating out a freaking vending machine for the last week and I'm going to run this script. And if I get it wrong, that guy's in trouble. And it was that moment that I said, you know, I, I just read it again. <laughs> I read that script over and over and over again. And I just thought, you know what? That's when it matters, right? That's when it matters, right? That uh, IT folks are doing stuff that is serious and they want to have a, a tool that they can trust, right? They, they, they trust. What does that mean? That I read it and I know what the hell it's going to do. Like awk or Perl. You have no idea what the hell that thing's going to do. I guarantee you. You know, you they call it the write only language. You write it and then you look and it's like, what the hell does that mean? What's, what's it going to do? I got no idea. Here, you need to read it, write it, and you're going to know what it's going to do. And then, right, you're like uh, back to this trust, like maybe, maybe I'm not entirely sure. So if you're not sure if there's ever a side effect, just, just add dash what if. Dash what if? Yeah, it tells you what it would have done. And then, well, what did it do? Like, okay, hey, what, what actually happened? Just type dash verbose, and we'll keep track of all that. And so that was kind of the thinking. Now, that said, that's where, from the command line, where I got this verb noun, right, so that you can, when you read it, it reads like a sentence, right? Get dash process slash where, or dash pipe to where, uh, handles greater than 500, pipe to format table, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right? Just reads like a sentence. Like I know what that does. And then uh, on the language itself, there, honestly, I think, you know, in retrospect, basically, just to be clear, you know, Bruce Payette and uh, Bill, uh, sorry, uh, Bruce Payette and Jim Truer were like, they owned the language. And I like delegated that to them. And I said, you know, Bruce, I don't know if you had Bruce on the show. Yes. And Jim. Freaking, freaking, uh, yeah, freaking oh, geniuses. Yeah. They're just yes. so... So and so I I I did the smart thing and said these are the smart people <laughs> I give it to them uh, and le gave them a lot of leeway. In retrospect, I look at it and I said mm, I might have wanted to had a little bit heavier hand in editing, but chances are if I did, I would have screwed it up. I think the language is a little bit too verbose. In particular, like when you do a function call and you have parameter that's that's pretty heavy you know i probably would have gone with p which would have been too light so i probably would have screwed it up but i think that i think some of the some of the uh ceremony around our function calls is a little too heavy because, because 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 i think you can you can get the clarity without uh the verbosity in some of those areas right uh so you're not the biggest fan of aliases I'm or, sorry, you're a huge fan of aliases, right? I am. So yeah, now I was talking about to, to Andrew about this before the show. And it's like, hey, I, now that it's I've had some distance from the, you know, the, being directly involved in PowerShell, uh, I'm just going to come out and say, there's this thing about, oh, don't use aliases in script. I think that's all wrong. I, I think aliases are awesome. Um, they're there for a reason. Uh, and they're great. Now, then people say, well, why don't you, why why do people say don't put aliases in scripts? And it generally comes down to two issues. One is clarity, right? But I'll assert like um, like GPS, we all know what GPS does. We know what LS does. We know what DIR does. We know what SAL does. You know, there's a bunch of things just everybody knows and there's no confusion. So bonk. And then there's something that says, well, um, security. Like oh somebody can uh, uh, somebody can hack your script by whacking the alias, but that's not really true. I mean, well, sorry, it's true, but it's not true in the way you think it's true. It's also true of get process. You can go do go to your go to your terminal shell now, right? Type get process and see what you get. Okay, now type you know sal get process to be uh, uh, dir. And then type get process or GPS. And guess what? You're going to get dir. <laughs> so you can alias anything. Now, the only way you cannot alias things is when you give a fully qualified command name. And a fully qualified command name is you know, module name slash fully named. And that, and it's again, architecture. That was the idea. Like, hey, when it really matters, and there are times when it does matter, when you're doing something like GIA, right? 
hey, that's I'm building a security layer. It must be secure. You can get that, okay? But you get that at extreme verbosity because you have to have the and and so typically it's it's hidden. Um, but in the general parlance of like, hey, I'm writing a script and I'm giving it to you, I think uh, using aliases and scripts is a okay. One that I think is a pretty clear winner is using select for select object. To oh, me, yeah. it's so evident. It's so much easier to read because you're if you're using select object, you're piping things together. You're already taking up some width. Make it a little easier. You just do select and then the properties you want. Exactly, a where, and then percent sign for uh, or question mark for for each. Those are pithy. Um, and again, it has to do with the who can read it, right? And uh, you might say, well, um, a complete novice might not know that question mark equals where or percent sign equals for each. And that's true. But beyond like the really novices, by the way, and, and then those people, do you really want those people modifying your script? <laughs> so probably you want a certain level of PowerShell knowledge and a certain level of PowerShell knowledge, then page faults in uh, clarity about which aliases are going to be common. Now, there are some that are just like very, very obscure and weird and, and you wouldn't know what they do. That, yeah, fine. Don't use those, you know. Yeah. So there's a decision to be made about how off the beaten path is, is readable. But I think if you're writing blogs and stuff for the public, use the full names. There are super beginners, but internally and... Well, yes and no. Um, again, for the, like, if you're doing something with uh, VM networking, absolutely, <laughs> right? But like for each, um, you know, one of the one of the points, yeah, so what, what does it matter about verbosity? There's a sort of sweet spot of signal to noise ratio, right? And, uh, and so... Basically, by leveraging aliases, you can tune that. And so often, uh, you know, because I, I was originally going to do the same thing you did when I was writing my blogs. And then what I found was the blogs had a low signal noise ratio and they, they, they started folding over. And so all of a sudden I put a percent sign and to fit on a line. And it's like, eh, that, that improves the clarity. You, you must be this tall to ride to go on this ride. You must know this amount of PowerShell to appreciate this block. <laughs> well, hot takes with Jeffrey Snover. Thank you there for you the uh, that segment. I want to there tap be back. Some controversy. You said the verbosity. You mentioned a story at Elvis Presley Memorial Hospital yeah. where you were going wild, and I believe uh, Kenneth Hansen. He was, a, I believe, a PM early on, and there were a few oh, yeah. principles. And I, I read this in Shell of an Idea. And one of the principles was the principle of 2 a.m. When you're working uh -huh. on something at 2 a.m., you're just trying to get your do job done. It needs to just work. And that sounds like you on the floor of that data center at the hospital. That's the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center principle. By the way, Kevin, Kenneth Hansen wrote a, a fantastic book, All Your Readers Should Go Out and Buy. And it really was like, uh, uh, you know, all the ways we ran the PowerShell team, uh, and it's called uh, Leadership of Small Teams. Leadership of Small Teams, I think. Okay. Anyway. Small Team Leadership, 50 small ideas teams. after 30 it is years a, on the job. It is a fantastic book. You know, really encapsulated a lot of the, the wisdom and the practical stuff that uh, is behind it. It was a fantastic com uh, companion to Shell of an Idea. Awesome. And I think there's so many, I mean, PowerShell and a success, it's kind of a unique thing. There's so many lessons that you can learn, not as someone who's going to write the next PowerShell, but just as someone navigating IT and trying to get things done, even within your own organizations, because there's a lot of challenges that can come up uh, with that. But yep. one concept that, that I've sort of noticed with you is ambition. Right, You had a lot of ambition to be able to follow through these ideas and to think outside the box and to ask for forgiveness, not permission, and, and all these types of things. How did you, like, why were you so ambitious? Why did you think something like PowerShell could be possible? I know you mentioned you're an architect in the past, but that's kind of a big thinking idea. Where did you, how did you come to that point where you thought that'd be possible? Yeah, um, well, I think everybody goes to Microsoft to have an impact on the world. And certainly that was the case for me, you know, because I, I remember when the Microsoft reached out to me, I said, no. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, no? I don't want to talk to you. I was like, well, why not? It's because your software is shit. 
I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they're like, wait a second. And, uh, and the reason why I ended up talking to them was Dave Thompson reached out to me and I'd met him before through some engagements. And I just thought the world of him. And so then he said, Jeffrey, I want to talk to you. And so, okay, well, Dave, I'll talk to you. But then once I got involved in the process again, <laughs> you know, I met with Jim Alchin and I uh, said, well, you know, do you have any concerns? I said, yeah, your software's crap. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to work with, on crap software. It's an embarrassment. And he said, yeah, I know. He says, but I need to make it better and I need help. And, and just think, if you're able to come here and do that, think of the impact on the world you could have. It's like, you got me. <laughs> and so I had to join. Uh, and so that was the point. It's like, yeah, he, you know, he's here to, to change the world. And, and that you did. You took that and ran with it. Which is really, it's honestly, really. inspiring. It's exciting. You got me fired up over here. Loving the PowerShell. Yay. But, you know, that was a, a big chunk of your career was sort of creating PowerShell and <laughs> supporting that. And then, uh, I guess a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago or so, you pivoted, you went to Google. Can you give us some info about what you're up to these days, what you can and can't share? Yep. Yeah. So um, I'm working in SRE. Uh, site reliability engineering. <clears throat> and so really the, the goal is to, you know, kind of apprentice myself to the art and science of running planetary scale software that really, really works. You know, there's very few places that do that. I believe as an industry, we don't do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of bailing wire and bubble gum and duct tape behind the scenes. Uh, and so I wanted to really, and I thought, well, Google was the place to, to do that. Uh, and the, the thought was, hey, kind of learn that uh, and then um, figure out how to, you know, amplify that, figure out how other people can do that. And so I've been working and I talked to Ben Trainer, he's the inventor of SRE. And he invited me to come to Google and really kind of help write the next chapter of SRE, uh, which is focused in on risk management. So if you think about um, SRE, a lot of it has been sort of incident response. You know, we have a problem and then we drill in and we find the root cause and then we fix it, which is basically find and fix problems after a loss has occurred. And that's served us very well, right? Uh, but then, Google's gotten really good at it. I mean, really, really good at it. So how much juice is there and left in the squeeze there? And so now the idea is like, hey, can we shift gears and try and find and fix problems before a loss has occurred? And, and how do you think about that, right? Because you know, risk is infinite. So how do you manage something that's infinite in a way that's practical? And then how do you, if you're doing it, how do you know that it's practical? Or you're just like, burn in cash. So that's the stuff I've been working on. That's fun. So it sounds yeah. like uh, what you did in PowerShell was you sort of, you spent a good bit of time identifying the problem space, and getting acquainted with what that looks like. And it sounds like you're sort of doing a similar thing in the SRE space now, where you're really identifying, thinking about things from a pretty high level perspective and the whole system, um, which I'm curious, what do you think about systems thinking or do you I, i'm sure you're very capable at it since you know that's a lot of what architecture is you have to think of a lot of moving parts and a whole project but is that a skill that you've developed over time does it impact you outside of just technical choices because for me I'm, I'm sure i'm not as good at it as you but it's been such a joyous thing and i learned those skills through powershell and through being able oh, to interact fantastic. and develop systems and it's been so impactful in my life um, in so many ways and so just curious to hear if that's been a thing for you Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so part of this I see is, you know, your weakness is your strength, right? Uh, your strength is your weakness. So one of the, the weaknesses I have is I, I don't deal with complexity very well. I don't have a particularly good or functional working memory. And so if something requires like a gazillion pieces to get all in your head and like figure it out, it's like, that ain't going to work for me. And so I'm always looking to throw information away throw data away and look for the F equals MA, right? Force equals mass times acceleration, right? So my, I'm a, I'm a, my background is physics, right? And so I'm always looking for those, those gen, what I call generator functions, those kind of core principles that are simple, that are universal or, or scoped, but basically that, that can be used to generate answers. So for instance, like, like if you, if, if I showed you, if I showed you a bridge, could you build another bridge? And the answer is no, right? Because each bridge is different. But but 
if I taught you mechanical engineering and F equals MA, then all of a sudden you can go and you say, okay, well, how big's the bridge and how long is it? And what's the soil and what's the depth and da, 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 build a bridge. And oh, here's another one, da, 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 build a bridge. So I'm always looking for that generator function. Um, and again, I think it's back to my weakness of like, if I was better at, at working set memory and, and could hold all this stuff in my head, maybe I'd try and do that. I can't. So I'm constantly looking for another play, which is what's the simplest thing. Now, the other benefit of the simplest thing is that then you can communicate it and you can communicate it. By the way, so like you, you introduced me as the inventor of PowerShell. I'd sort of like to, to clarify that. Because in some sense, it's true. In and a, in, a, in a very, very meaningful sense, it's not true. So yeah, I definitely invented sort of the core idea, the core pipeline, the common pipe, the common uh, parser, the adaptive type system, the namespaces for uh, various things, et cetera. But then we hired a group of awesome engineers. And, and the thing I'm proudest of was I was able to create a conceptual and engineering framework where these awesome engineers could come and add their brilliance in a way that was additive and cohesive and harmonious, as opposed to disjoint and pulling off one against one another. Uh, and so, you know, and then the book tells that story so well, right? I, I always am, am reticent to go down this path because I mentioned, you know, a few names and then I, I don't mention the others, but clearly we mentioned uh, Jim Truer and, uh, and, 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 uh, Bruce Payette, Kenneth Hansen, you know, um, uh, yeah, anyway, just so many names of awesome engineers. Now, again, how was that possible? And the answer is because there was clarity, right? Clarity about what it was we were building, clarity around a set of priorities. We actually listed the priorities, right? Number one, if there's any ever, if there's ever any doubt, there's never any doubt, which is to say security. Then I forget what the other words were, but we had a published list and something come up and like, oh, should we do X or Y? I said, like, okay, well, what is this? This is security versus that. Security wins. We do this. Oh, but it really means this. So is there some confusion again? It, security wins. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> and by the way, next time, you don't need to come to me. Just look at the list. Apply the list. And then people are like, can we really? It's like, yeah. I mean, if you want, come back to me, double check. And like that, yep. List, let's apply the list. And occasionally we'd like, okay, yeah, that, that, that's a compromise I really don't like. Is there another way we can do this to minimize things? Because we can't change the priorities, really must. And we'd find creative ways to solve it. But anyway, but that kind of clear thought you can communicate, people can remember it, and then they can apply it. A couple thoughts. One, I'll give a couple of shout outs to some other people that were mentioned in the book, just to kind of yes, get please. a little bit of coverage. We got Charlie Chase, the group program oh, yeah. manager. Kenneth Hansen, as we mentioned. What a great Charlie Chase story. So, oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> Charlie calls me into his office. So I you think you've heard the story about how you know, they did not want us into in Windows. They did not want us into Windows. They did not want us into Windows, right? And so we like knew they had the seven rules of getting .NET into Windows. And so we went and we made sure we were green and then green on all of them. And then we were ready, right? So Charlie sends the, the letter. It's like, we you know, doing the, this process, we want back in. And he immediately gets back this email from an exec. And he calls me in his room. He's like, what am I going to do? And the exec says, withdraw this request. And we're both looking at it like, oh, damn. And this is a senior exec. This is not a low level or medium level. This is like top exec of Windows, right? And he's like, withdraw the request. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. What do we do? We could do this. And Charlie just looks at me and says, no, nah, F it. And he goes and says, no, you decline it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then, and then the guy did. The guy refused it. And then that set up the conversation between execs because, uh, and, and, and ultimately we prevailed. But anyway, he was, Charlie is such a great guy. Awesome. Such a decisive leader. Nice. We also have Lee Holmes. Oh, fantastic so good. security guy. I know. So good. And the security features are something we often talk about in PowerShell that are pretty exceptional. Um, so I should have him on the podcast sometime, but he's done some great oh, talks. Absolutely. And there's some great blogs about the security features in PowerShell. And I think that's one area that I try and highlight because it, I think more people need to take advantage of it. 
Yeah, people misunderstand it. I mean, here's the thing. Nothing could be better than for your hackers or the people attacking you to, to use PowerShell because <laughs> you can know exactly what they're doing, exactly what they're doing, exactly where they are. If they write it in Python, you're screwed. They write it in C++, you're screwed. If they were in PowerShell, you got them. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Just oh, kind of again, configure a few things. He, he did such an awesome job. Shout out to Lee Holmes. Hamant Mahawar, program manager. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Bruce awesome. Payette, as we mentioned. You, the architect, Jim Truer, and Daryl Ray. Daryl, he, he was the original guy. He had the original shell, got the original funding, called it Kermit. I said, I'll only join if you get rid of that crappy name. <laughs> <laughs> call, it, call it Monad. <laughs> he didn't want to give it up. I said, no, I'm serious. I said, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he got us the original funding. Nice. Quite the cast of characters. And I think to your point earlier, we really do stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, there have been so many people down to the smallest contributors in the community that just help make it be an awesome place that fosters growth. And you mentioned you got a nice cast of characters that could collaborate and some of the sort of initial people who helped shape PowerShell into what it is now. Um, but I think that that approach of like the collaborative nature that you all had on the team, it seemed to, and I want to get your opinion on how this happened, but how did the PowerShell community get to be as open and sort of cohesive as it is today? Like, did you see that change over time? Because it is kind of unique from my experience in different tech communities. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I, 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 I think part of it is we understood how important the community was Right again, that um, you know, there's only so many things we were going to do that Windows is going to do, and that uh, the community was going to do a lot of stuff. The community was going to reach out to our partner community to get them to get support because if we did it, they weren't going to listen to us. Uh, so we valued the community, and then I just give a huge credit out to some of the early community people, Don Jones. Right? I think have you ever seen the first follower video? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I attribute Don as being the first follower, you know, created the movement. And of course, he set the, the tone. He was, I cannot tell you how many times I would reach out to Don with an issue, like, hey, Don, what do we do about this? And Don would say, you should do that. And nine plus times out of 10, that's what we would do. Uh, and then Jason Helmlich, again, finally, we got Jason on the team. They never got Don, but we got Jason on the team. Again, fantastic early contributor. Uh, so I'd say, you know, those people sort of prob probably, I'm trying to think whether, they, I would say probably they cast the die and then the team supported it. Yeah. Awesome. And on the subject of Jason Helmick, so there was a pretty impactful training series that often people recommend the MVA series. I think it was like getting started on PowerShell, something or other. I have a link in the show notes, 1.2 million views in the past three years alone. And it was recorded Seriously? way before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one you know, was re-uploaded. Yeah. They wanted to get rid of it all. I mean, I get think I, the video I saw uh, was on YouTube re-uploaded. Well, I think, I don't know, maybe I did that. But, I, you know, it's back to that Microsoft, you know, chasing butterflies and squirrels. You know, so at some point they're like, oh, this is old content. It's like, well, but it's still getting a gazillion views. It's like, yeah, but we want to we want to have fresh, we want to we want to get rid of everything old. So I went and like downloaded it. I don't know if that's the stuff that's up on YouTube or what. But anyway, so we made copies of it. Yeah. No, that's a massively impactful series. And one thing that I noticed in it that I hadn't seen in IT trainings before that in my career was how human you both were. Um, you had slightly different styles, and I, I definitely learned a lot from Jason Helmick's style of you know being okay to make mistakes and be the one that shows kind of the right way by doing the wrong way, and you by mistyping things and being sort of honest and you know not having the most super polished, here's the line that you run, works perfect. Here's the next line. You, you sort of embraced that human element. And I think at the time that was a bit unique. And nowadays creators and educators are praised for being authentic. But I think you all were doing it quite a bit ahead of time. What was up with that? Why did you identify that that's how you needed to communicate? And how did you know it would resonate? Yeah, you know, I, I, I just always hated these, um, these visual studio demos, right? Where they get up there in the keynote and like, click, click, click. And look, I've got a, 
SQL website. That is. It's like, oh, wow, that is really easy. And then I go and I click, and it's like, what? What did he click again? What? 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 And it's like, I'm an idiot. And it's like, every time I would try and do what they tried to do, like I failed and I felt like an idiot. And then I was like, you know, screw it. I'm an idiot. I'm not going to pay any attention to that stuff. I obviously I'm not a, a sequel guy or whatever. <laughs> and, and so like, yeah, no, I mean, the re that's not the way the world works. The world is messy and we got to be clear about it being messy because you are going to make mistakes and, uh, and, and that's okay. Right. It's okay. And, and it's natural. I want you to make a mistake and then say, not you're dumb, but oh, what did that mistake tell me? And oh, maybe next time I should ask that minus what if <laughs> or minus verbose. Uh, so yeah, it was really that that uh, again, sort of. I think that the thing that I and then the team did very very well is to always put the customer at the center of everything, you know, the center of our design decisions, the center of our thinking, etc. And so, yeah, when I just sat there, it's like, they're going to look at this stuff, see it's all perfect, make a mistake, and then feel like there's a problem. No. Yeah. One thing I talk about on the podcast a lot is how back in the day, before this video series, this was one of probably a few things that helped me understand that people writing code and working in Microsoft and these different things that I kind of had on a pedestal, these are just people. These are just people. They probably practice more than I have and spent more time trying to learn these things, but they're just people. They make similar mistakes. They're going to fall into similar patterns. And eventually, if you keep growing, you get to a better spot. Um, and that's something I really profess to everyone on the podcast. You can accomplish many similar things to what our guests have accomplished. If you just give yourself the time and space to grow and, and keep growing, keep pushing yourself, you can do fantastic things. Um, and that is such a, a joyous opportunity when you think you have like a ceiling on your career or what you can accomplish. And then you're you're able to see people, leaders like you and Jason to model good behavior and then you can adapt it and then boom, you end up in a different place. And I really appreciated yeah. that approach and it was pretty transformational for me. Yeah, you know, recently I was reminded of a, of a little, little bit that I did in a keynote talk and I was like, well, you know, that was really great. I wish more people had figured that one out or, or had gotten more airplay. And what I did was I was talking about digital transformation and how it was important how you can use transitions to accelerate your career and how there's digital transformation by the way ai is even a bigger transformation and so you can use by the way just look up snover transition career on youtube you'll see that talk i gave it a couple times all sort of the same story and and what i said was and, and it wasn't in those talks but in another talk i pointed out i said i want you to stop i want you to think about your ceo I want you to think about all the people that report to that CEO and all the people that report to them. And I want you to recognize that in the next five to 10 years, the vast majority of them are going to be gone. And they're going to be replaced by a new generation of leaders that who, who are those leaders? Those are the leaders that can address the problems that these generation of leaders are not able to address. Right? Are they able to ones? Are they, are those leaders? They are they the ones that are going to drive digital transformation? Probably not. Right? They probably start it, but they're probably not the ones that have it in their bones how to really take it to eleven. AI are they those guys the ones going to be lead the AI revolution? Chances are not. And so the point I make is like it could be you. Like lean in. Now I'm going to say again. I'm not part of Microsoft, so I get to say anything I want. If you, Satya Nadella, let me just first start by saying, I think he was one of the, the one of the all-time greatest CEOs ever, okay? Now, I will also tell you that if you had, you know, before he became CEO, if you wound the clock back, I don't know, five years, maybe five years, and you took all the executives at Microsoft, put them in a room, and stack ranked them, and said, okay, who, which of these is going to be the next CEO? I can guarantee you Satya would have been in the bottom third, probably towards the bottom of that bottom third. He had not really generated success. He had not really created any innovation. There's really not much there. And he ended up getting the job because at a couple of stages, he was in the right place at the right time and and him. Um, and then when he got that job, oh my heavens, what incredible success, 
Okay. So point being, like, yeah, uh, there's people for the time and the times change and therefore they need new leaders. Uh, and that can be you. It, it really can. Again, such a Nadella. I'm, I, I lo- again, I'm loving him. I'm not trying to rock at you at him. But he not, he, no one would have looked and said, Satch is going to be our next CEO. Absolutely not. Keep working. Keep putting yourself out there for opportunities. You never know. Commerce server, you know, Bing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, these were not, these are not, these are not viewed as like, ah, we, we need, we need more of that. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Azure Stack earlier, and I know that you had a couple of different roles at Microsoft. And one that I, I recall, I didn't like check LinkedIn, but I think it was like AI ethics, right? Ah. And that was several years ago, I think. So I'm curious to hear what your experience was like with that, uh, what you can share, but also to kind of see AI being out there in the world now. Um, yeah. So it actually that. wasn't a, it wasn't a role. It was, uh, I was doing AI for office and really kind of AI infrastructure. But I could see the ramifications of this. And I thought, hey, I, I need to get ahead of the curve and talk about some of the AI ethics. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting area. Um, you know, it's an area where I could have said then, I'll say now, it'll be the case five years from now, we're going to make mistakes. Um, full stop. You know, a lot of this stuff, it's hard to, people who haven't like gotten into it, it's hard to really grasp what it is. But have you ever seen a theremin? Mm-hmm. You know what a theremin is? Yeah. Like like these large language models, it's like playing with a theremin. Like, <laughs> it's like you don't know what the hell you're doing. Like a piano, you play a piano, hit this key, you hear that note. Theremin, it's like, well, geez, if you have a ring on, you're going to get a different thing. And if there's some water somewhere, you're going to get some different things. It's like, oh, what the hell's going on? It's a very, uh, if, if, you, if you guys don't know what a theremin is, look it up. It's for a weird musical instrument that detects like sort of like impedance or inductance in the air and creates these weird noises. That's what these language models are. We, they're not, you know, deterministic systems. Um, they're very weird. We don't know what's going on with them. And then weird things happen. And anybody who attributes uh, all this like, oh, that really means, you know, Google is, you know, crazy woke or they're biased against these types of, it's like, uh, no, just doesn't, we just don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Yeah, it seems <laughs> but, like. But, you, but what does matter is, is your head and your heart in the right place? And are you being forthright in trying to get ahead of those issues and, and get on them when you find out about them? Yeah, there will definitely be more. Like you said, it is a pretty new technology, relatively, uh, considering is, how complex it is. It's crazy exciting. Crazy it, exciting. Definitely is a big changer to workflows, especially long term as these tools mature, which I'm yeah. looking forward to. Yep. But it seems like a lot of it with different models, it's like throwing spaghetti at a wall. They make a slight change. It changes how the spaghetti th- shows up on the wall. Kind of is like yeah. tossing darts in the in the dark. Well, and, you know, there's this temperature variable, right? Which says, <clears throat> I mean, it's intentional. They ask the same question five times. You get five different answers. Or you could get it so that you get the same answer, but it's going to be a crappy answer. So if you want a good answer, you, you're buying into variability. And if you want a consistent answer, you're buying into low quality. Wait, 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 wait a second. Let's, let's play that back again. So I ask you the same question and I get different answer every time. Yeah. What the hell's that? Yeah. <laughs> good. And, and so that's why you're like, okay, well, for math. Okay, well, it's not a math tool, right? Fun times. It's yeah. it's so cool that we get to work in this space though, where there's new stuff emerging. Our brain gets to keep learning new things and solving new problems as there keeps being new prop new technologies, new problems. Yeah, I gotta say, I'm just thrilled by the problem space of uh, AI accelerated hardware, you know, AI hardware acceleration. Uh, it's such a mess. I mean, the thing I just keep pointing out, right? So you know, Gemini, that's our Google you know, big brain thing. And uh, that, I can't give you the details, but it consumed an incredible amount of compute, an incredible amount of energy for an incredible amount of time. Uh, and that's to train it and then to run it, ditto. And and at, for most ways you think about it, it is less capable than the average human, right? Yeah. Well less capable. 
And yet the average human brain consumes 25 watts. I like to say it varies, you know, average Microsoft technical fellow, maybe 30 or 35 watts, <laughs> Mark Rusinovich, maybe 20 watts. Oh. Uh, oh, because he's so efficient. He's so efficient. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, but that, that delta between 25 watts and what's consumed on these large language models yeah. means that there are many, many, like sort of six to maybe 10 orders of magnitude of efficiency that's left on the table that we got to go find and fix. And it'll be everywhere, right? From the how we train to how we do, how we build these models mm -hmm. to the mathematics, to the hardware acceleration. Um, it's exciting. Yeah, and I think improvements to that hardware component of it has massive trickling positive benefits when these uh, models are getting used so much. You know, 5% improvement really can be significant uh, when you put it across the whole industry. Yeah, and so a lot of it has to do with kind of core architecture, you know, issues. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about the compute, but in my mind, it all comes down to bandwidth and I.O., and uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Jim Keller's uh, discussed Tensorin's architecture. Now, I don't know that Jim's got the right answers, but I know he's asking the right questions. And boy, he's got some really exciting stuff. I mean, I just watched that and I was like, What's it called? What's it called? Let Tens me sure get it. Tensorrent, T-E-N-S-O-R-R-E-N-T. And it's Jim Keller, he's the famous chip designer. Uh, and he gave a talk recently, I think it was like some AI hardware conference. Uh, if you if you do it and if you start the video and he makes fun of software people in the first minute, that's the right one. Awesome. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a character. Awesome. Oh, I see that. Okay, cool. I'll have a link in show notes to that as well. I have some some different questions now. A little Go bit less, less serious. So... Well, this one's a little bit serious. So as an ambitious person, someone with big goals and a big vision at times, how do you handle work-life balance and sort of <laughs> navigating that in your life? And I know it's a juggling act for all of us, but have there been any insights you've found over the years? Uh, well, first, you don't want to take advice from me on the work-life balance. I screwed that up so badly so many times. Uh, you know, there's a story I like to tell is that I was traveling like way too much. And uh, I was at one business trip then immediately fed into another one. And I called home to my wife and I said, oh, I, I can't wait for this weekend when I can come home and visit with you and Brandon. And I've never been more wrong per syllable than to use the word visit with my wife and kid. <laughs> so clearly I got the work-life balance all wrong there. Um, look, there's no easy answer there. There's none. But I also say that, you know, when I was doing PowerShell, did not have work-life balance. I think if I had, I probably would not have been able to do PowerShell. So, you know, only, only, yeah, okay, let's go there. Let's go there. So I remember Steve Ballmer met with a small group of us and, uh, and he said something. He said, uh, you know, any of you in this room could be the next CEO. And somebody laughed. He says, no, no, no. I'm serious. He says, if you've reached the level you've reached, you have what it takes to be CEO. But there's more than just smarts. There's smarts and there's also uh, ambition, right? Do you have the ambition? Do you want to do that? And are you willing to sacrifice? He says, because let me tell you, as you move up this role in this world, uh, work-life balance, there is no work-life balance as the CEO of, of Microsoft. Is that something you're willing to sacrifice? Because Nobody's going to say you, you made the wrong choice if you say no. But if you say yes to the job, you're committing yourself to no work-life balance. And it's like, oh, okay. So here's the thing. There are certain jobs that require a, 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 a non-work-life balance. And it's okay to not say no to those things. Um, and that's the deal. Yeah. And hopefully if you're giving up the work-life balance, you're getting those big paychecks. To, uh, well, to here's the joke about that, right? So here's my joke about Microsoft executives, right? <laughs> my joke was that Microsoft executives get compensated very well for each of the months that they get employed before they get fired. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I would then say, hey, um, indeed, and by the way, it's sort of a joke, not joke, right? Most executives at Microsoft end up getting shown the door. 
Okay. So now the question is, okay, so you made a lot of money for a certain amount of time. This is called calculus. <laughs> and I encourage you to think about the time integrated uh, 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 lifetime earnings, right? Which is to say, hey, maybe you can take a lo lower job uh, and deal with it longer and make more money that way. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to maximize things. Think about the time dimension. Because again, CEOs, what's the average, you know what the average duration of a CEO is in America? No, what is it? It's like five, six years, relatively short. Yeah. Relatively short. So anyway, so you know, if you're going to a job that like, think about what that job's going to give you and your ability to stay in that job for the next 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And also if you have like a high profile job, it's sometimes hard to pivot to lower roles. Um, yeah. It's a yeah. Time. Well, a lot of that problem is people's egos, but yes. Yeah. I uh, got some advice. Don't become a director because it's really hard to find other positions that are not director after becoming one. But I think that depends on the employer. Yeah. yeah. And also the size of the company. So, you know, you go to director at like Microsoft, boy, you probably find yourself lots of roles as director or even above. But if you're director at a, at a startup company, then what's that mean? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So weird question here. Are you a cat or a dog person or neither? Oh, yeah. Uh, both, actually. Oh. Both. Yeah. Wow, pleasing all Now, audience. we've had cats. We haven't had dogs. Uh, and I was always afraid of dogs because I once got bit as a kid. But then my kids are super dog fans and they kind of like won me over. <laughs> awesome. Now, are there any non-PowerShell hobbies that you dabble in? I know Jim Truer is a music extraordinaire. He is. He really he, is. I mean, that's so cool. You know, he was on the, the Thriller album, right? Yes, I do. We talked about it on the pod. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That that's is so, so cool. Small world, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm basically a reader. I read. So. Kindle, right? Yeah. Uh, Kindle or books, yeah. Okay. I remember you yeah. saying uh, some tweet maybe five years ago, who knows, but something about how your Kindle is so awesome because you can have so many books just right there. It is. Yeah. And so I've been, uh, you know, pretty heavily into, oh, oh sorry. And, uh, and the material science. So this year, finally, uh, I took my vacation and I went to the material science research society uh, in Boston. You know, I always wanted to do that, but uh, you know, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to get anything out of it. You know, maybe I'll just go there and it'll all bounce off me and, and then I had to fly from Seattle, but now I'm in Boston area. So I thought, heck, it's always here in the fall. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to it. I had a blast. It was so cool. I learned so much. And then I got hooked up. Uh, the University of Texas Dallas asked me to come give a talk to the faculty and students, and so that was great. So yeah, material science. I love it. Nice. What's your favorite lobster roll place? Oh. Excellent question. So I used to think that all you could do was to, that lobster rolls were perfection and that all you could do was screw it up. So just leave it alone. Just do it. Just leave it alone. Uh, and then there was a place in Maine called High Roller Lobster in Portland, Maine. And they did crazy shit, like lime jalapeno aioli on a lobster roll. And at first my, like, look, you, all you can do is screw up a lobster roll. But something made me say, I'm going to give it a try. And it was insanely good. So High Roller Lobster, Portland, Maine. Absolute favorite. Nice. Yeah. If I ever go there, I'll let you know. I'll post a food review for you. There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jeffrey. Fantastic chat. Yeah, I had a great time. We'll have to do it some other time. Uh, but really appreciate you sharing your perspective, informing our audience about some of the different decisions PowerShell's made over the years and how we ended up where we are now, because we're all here. And I wanted to say, so if people want to keep track of you and see what you're up to, how can they find you on the World Wide Web? Yep. Uh, so I'm still on Twitter, uh, less active. Than, uh, that's kind of been a bit of a dumpster fire. Uh, but yeah, I'm still on Twitter at, J, at Jay Snover. Uh, and then on LinkedIn, Jeffrey awesome. Snover. And I'll have links to those in the show notes. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you to Jeffrey for joining us. If you liked what you heard today, leave us a like, comment, subscribe. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back next week for another awesome episode of the PowerShell Podcast. Thanks again, Jeffrey, for joining us. Thank you. Cheers. 
Thanks for listening to the PowerShell Podcast. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick.